Okay, hello everyone. Uh, we're twins, uh, more or less. Uh, we're from Sematex, and today we're going to talk about uh, using neuroscience to actually become a better developer. Uh, here's Radu, and I'm Rafal, and... Uh, old pictures. Yes, old pictures. Maybe you can see that. Uh, basically, I would like us to do one thing before we start the actual talk. Let's try an exercise. Don't get up. <laughs> uh, uh, I would like to divide us uh, into two separate audiences. The one on the left, here, on my left, your right, uh, I would like you to try to memorize a certain amount of images that I'll show in just a second. And the right, my right side, your left side, I would like you to take pen and paper and write down the key things that you think you see on the picture. And the picture is like this. We have a book, we have a cat, we have a PC, a parrot, an owl on the earth, a recycle sign, and let's call it a hawk. Now let's take five seconds, try to memorize, try to write down the key parts. I'll get back to these pictures once again at the middle of the talk, and then I'll tell you why I asked you to do that. But before, I'll give the voice to Radu. Yeah, we basically cut things in half. I have half the talk, he has half the talk. Um, so I'll start with a quick map of the brain as far as we're concerned here. Um, but actually before that, I want to mention that pretty much everything both of us um, are talking about is backed by um, some studies and books and stuff like that. You can find um, them on GitHub. It doesn't look as it should. Anyway, it's on GitHub, Sematex, blah, blah, webcam, zap grab. Um, it's, feel free to open issues, submit PRs, uh, it's all open source. Though some of the books and articles are not free, think of it kind of like Red Hat. Um, so I want to talk about four elements of the brain or around it that um, are of interest for us here. One of, us, one of them is, is probably something most of you have heard about before, uh, the prefrontal cortex. This is basically our CPU. So uh, it's used in all the decision making, in comparing stuff, all the logical thinking is kind of there. Um, and th the thing about this that may be surprising is that it's quite slow. So um, by all intents and purposes, we are single threaded. Um, if you just Google multitasking, you will find studies about how we're better off on drunk or on cocaine or I don't know half dead, I guess, than if we try to multitask. Um, yeah, so don't do that. Um, we're also uh, like, if you think like the L2 cache, um, so the things we can actively work with, uh, this is very limited. We can only think about like three to five um, elements at a time. Um, also, the memory bandwidth is very limited. So think about times when you try to remember a phone number. This just uh, goes very slowly. Um, so, uh, oh, and it's also very uh, energy intensive. So the brain eats about 10 times more energy than our average self. So our job, as with computing, is to protect the CPU, not to use it when we don't actually need it. Um, the next thing I want to talk about has to do with the emotional system and a central piece here, there are actually two of them, they're called the amygdala. So they're right in the middle of the brain and um, it has lots of functions. Uh, for example, um, they can, they help with like emotional sort of learning, which is more efficient. Rafael is going to talk about learning. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, for my half of the talk, uh, it's basically, um, clicker doesn't work. <gasps> Thankfully, we don't have demos. So it's basically kind of like our anxious boss. Um, so it's, it's the, cent the center that kind of is responsible for the stress responses. That's where it originates from. Um, and our job, obviously, is to keep it cool, right? We don't want to get overwhelmed by emotions and kind of get distracted and not have energy for the CPU. Um, third thing I want to talk about, this is getting, uh, third thing I want to talk about are hormones and neurotransmitters. So for example, um, adrenaline um, is a bit of both. Um, when we're stressed up, 
we get adrenaline in our blood, which has lots of effects. So, for example, our uh, connections in the brain gets, uh, get faster. Uh, we get insulin in the blood, which will digest carbs into glucose. Uh, so all of that to make us kind of um, either fight or flight. Um, the way I think about hormones in general is kind of like networking in the fact that we need to be aware of networking so it doesn't become a bottleneck, right? Um, I'm going to uh, be more specific in a bit. And the fourth thing, which I won't really care that much about, but I was going to talk more about that, is basically the rest of the brain. Um, so for example, uh, in the back, we have the occipital lobe, which hosts the visual cortex. So that's used for processing images. Um, I'm giving this as an example because we're all visuals. We can process images much, much faster than we can process text, for example. Uh, so think of those as caches. We want to use them as much as possible. So to, uh, just to recap this very quick map of the brain, uh, the prefrontal cortex, that's our CPU. Then there's our fight-flight response, which uh, has its center in the amygdala. There are caches, which I don't care about. He's going to. Uh, and then there are hormones, um, which are, uh, are networking. At least that's how I see them. Um, and I'm going to keep, through my slides, I'm going to keep that map, map up there, and I'm going to highlight when I'm more concerned on one area or another. Uh, and my part has three parts. Uh, one of them is planning. I want to talk about the importance of planning and how we can account for how our brain works when we do the planning. Then uh, I want to talk about basically our energy cycle during the day and how we can account for that in order to be more productive. And th the third one is about communication and feedback and a kind of, um, I call this status threats because that's the, I think the central problem that we can very easily feel offended and get defensive and counterproductive. And then Rafael is gonna talk about learning. Um, all right, so I'll start with planning. Um, this is something we all do in various moments, whether it's a daily stand-up or sprint planning or what have you. Um, so I want to talk about why planning is important and then how, at least I think, is, is good to do it. Um, so the, the why is, first of all, we're, we're all mammals, and mammals are very addicted to certainty. Uh, if things are not certain, then we get all, all scared up. Um, and um, so basically the amygdala gets activated, we get stressed up, and it's harder to, f to get energy to the prefrontal cortex, to our CPU. So we need to kind of understand where we are. Um, and secondly, we get very easily distracted. Our brain is effectively an emergency junkie. We just want to take the most urgent task I'm pretty sure most of us can relate to that. We can take the urgent and actionable task instead of just thinking about what's important, what isn't important. So if we don't have that plan laid out, uh, it's gonna be more difficult to, to go along. Also, um, because we're emergency junkies, we are very prone to do context switching. And as with computing, context switching is expensive. Uh, it is expensive, so it's kind of unproductive if your goal is to do a longer, more important task. But um, because it lowers the overall brain activity, or I'm not sure if it's because of it, but anyway, in periods when you do context switching, you actually get more creative. So it's not all bad. Anyway, let's move on to how uh, I think planning uh, would work. So first of all, uh, I would order by importance. I think most planning tries to do that. So you, need, you want to be on fresh brains when you work on the most important task. Then I would order by ugliness. So basically, if a task is something that we hate, it just kind of sticks there in the back of our mind, generating stress, eating cycles. We don't want that. We want to get rid of them, as I mean, to finish them. Um, and third, and probably the most important thing, is to be conservative with the estimations. Why? Because um, of our, uh, I think it's called the reward system in literature. So basically, if, if you have a plan and you fail to do it, then you get uh, what is called an away response from the brain. So we have all sorts of hormones that come into place that try to make us 
avoid future similar things. Um, if we uh, manage to accomplish what we planned, then we get a surge of dopamine. And dopamine is uh, basically like the addiction hormone. We get very motivated to do more of that. It was thought that it's also like the pleasure hormone. That's kind of debatable, but certainly it gets us motivated. And also, uh, actually, I didn't. I haven't finished. <laughs> um, and also, if we exceed our expectations, then we get a strong surge of dopamine, and that's that's really kind of the uh, the best uh, human motivator that we are aware of to get stuff done. Um, and the corollary of that is. And we've probably all heard of that. Like, if you have a big task, divide it into smaller bits. That's why, because if you have smaller bits that are actionable, I can go ahead, do that, get that dopamine running, and you know, I get the vicious cycle. Also, very important is to feel some autonomy, right? Nobody wants uh, the, their plan to be imposed by someone else, like the boss telling you what to do. Um, probably that's why uh, we like having side projects. Um, Anecdotally, I want to mention a study that was done on rats to um, sort of illustrate this. So they gave rats cocaine, and rats ate the cocaine. That get dopam got dopamine in the system, addiction. They ate dopamine until they died. Then they repeated the experiment, but instead of giving the rats cocaine, they let the rats act uh, press a lever that will give them cocaine. <laughs> so now rats still ate cocaine until they died, but <laughs> 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 you would think, but they died later. Very important. Yeah. So, Sorry. If, so <laughs> if you want to have drugs and die later, put a lever there. Have side projects. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next part, uh, which is basically our daily cycle. So I will start with what our parents say, that we need to have a good sleep. And there's a whole sort of area of um, research around sleep. We are still not 100% understanding why sleep is important and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's important to go to bed at the same amount of time and wake up at the same amount of time because if we just keep switching it it doesn't work with like catching up and stuff it's like with medicine um, the one thing i do want to mention is that if we don't get enough sleep then the amygdala literally gets more energy like it gets more blood flowing into it it just grows in size and so we are much more likely to perceive things as threats to be stressed up um, and also I mean, it, that's always a, a corollary. Like, if, if we get the adrenaline, the um, amygdala activated, it's going to be harder to concentrate. It's going to be harder to get energy into the prefrontal cortex. And this is especially uh, uh, a problem for men. Women don't seem to suffer that much of this particular process. Um, then, yeah, levitating about 20 centimeters helps. Um, <laughs> but seriously, uh, there's plenty of research showing that meditation and praying, whatever floats your boat, helps literally restructure the brain. So you can get, first of all, like there was a myth that we can't produce gray matter. It's like we have this brain and it's going to slowly degrade until we die. No, we can actually produce uh, gray matter and it depends on uh, our lifestyle a lot. So like if we exercise, that helps, things like that. If we meditate or pray, that helps. And it also helps like not only produce gray matter overall, it's just it helps produce gray matter in the prefrontal cortex and not so much in the amygdala. If we are stressed up all the time, it's the opposite. We produce gray, gray matter in the amygdala. It's like, you know, whatever muscles you work, they will grow. Um, so then what I try to do, and I have to admit often fail, is to do the most important tasks um, and the ugliest tasks. Sometimes it's hard to choose which is which. Uh, very early in the day, when I'm on fresh brains, 
namely uh, the the body temperature is low i have the right amount of glucose uh, available to the brain that's when i think most of us are the most productive i don't really believe on this whole i'm a night owl i'm an early bird kind of person it's just research shows that at least for most of us we're 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 most productive in the morning uh then as we get towards lunch uh the because brain well the initial thought was that the brain needs glucose in order to run and that's only partially true um so anyway what what i meant to say was that as our glucose levels drop off we are, are finding it harder to concentrate i think all of us can relate to that the closer we get to lunch um the, the harder it is to concentrate uh, the one thing that i i find i mean nutrition is a whole branch right i'm not going to cover it in a quarter of a slide but one thing that i th i find interesting is well there's a bunch of things that i find interesting <laughs> <laughs> Let's no try way. to order by importance. Um, Agilinas. So first of all, if we eat too much carbs, they will get turned into fat. Um, so, but it is said that we, if we don't have enough carbs, then we don't have glucose flowing into our brain. But that apparently isn't true. If we have a low-carb diet, the liver will actually produce, I think it's called ketones, that uh, can fuel most of the brain. Um, and for the rest, it can actually break down protein and, um, and to get glucose out of there and fuel the rest of the brain that absolutely needs glucose. Um, anyhow, we have lunch, whatever you like to have for lunch. And then uh, after that, um, to access, we have that sort of food coma right after lunch, okay? So uh, to access that, that energy, um, we can do, try to do something engaging. Now, I don't, I'm saying engaging and not stressful because I try not to do stressful things, but this is really stress, okay? So um, if I have meetings, I try to schedule them right after lunch because they get me going and that they let me tap into that energy. And then as the day gets to an end, that's what I'm plan, trying to plan most of my context switching tasks because I can't really concentrate as much as I do in the morning. Um, one of them being emails. So I try to avoid spending lots of time with emails in the morning, although, as I said, we're emergency junkies. It's very uh, tempting to just answer all the emails. But um, I try to only account for those that matter for my planning and then move on and l let the rest of the day for you know the, small, the smaller tasks. Um, and then at the very end of the day, I'm trying to review what I've been working on um, to get that sense of accomplishment, which you know generates that dopamine. All right, third and final thing I will talk about, um, basically our communication and our feedback. So we are very quick to detect when something is threatening, when something is, um, we, we're quick to extract the negative stuff, really. And that's why I think when we, not, not I think, the research shows that if we have more, um, more clues about what the other person's intent is, um, we can communicate better, we can understand their in intention better, we don't, we're not as likely to feel threatened. That's why, for example, if I work with a new client, I'm trying to set up a video call because it's, it's less likely that I'm not going to like that person because the default is between friend and foe, you're going to be a foe. Um, it's, which is also why micromanagement is this bad, right? Like we pick up the negative signals, we feel threatened, we get into a defensive uh, stance, as you will. And we don't even need other people to feel status threats. We can internalize this and do it on our own. Uh, I'm sure none of us relates to a situation where we kind of start with a project and then we go, oh, this is not going to work, this is not going to work, and we get a bit stuck and we procrastinate. Um, no one relates to that, oh, right? Come on, we're all awesome. Um, this is the internal <coughs> status threat right there. Now, how do we communicate better and give better feedback? I'm going to tell you in five minutes. Um, no. I do want to bring one, uh, to use the F word here for feelings. I think they are very important um, in the context of 
um, having or not having a status, feeling or not feeling a status threat. Um, the, the one thing I want to mention about feelings is that they happen anyway. So like if we're trying to suppress them, we're actually using CPU, um, which uh, by the way is valid for all sorts of distractions. So um, if like the phone rings and I'm getting distracted here by the way, but anyway, if the phone rings and I don't want to look at it, that's going to take CPU. All the uh, superior control, I'm not sure exactly what the, what the technical term is, happens in uh, in the prefrontal cortex. So suppressing feeling doesn't really work. Um, what works is to either think about feelings or share them, right? So if I can talk to Rafal, hey dude, uh, whatever I'm worried about or, you know. Come on. No? Well, if I don't, at least I need to understand their significance. Like feelings are really uh, information, chunks of information. Uh, okay, and we, if, if I try to understand what they tell me and kind of act on that, that shifts energy from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex, which is what I want. Um, and last but not least, I want to talk about the overall sort of mindset. You might have heard of this uh, theory about the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset. Um, so basically, I can... Um, if I believe that my uh, intelligence is static, that my skills are static, then I'm more likely to feel status threats because uh, I'm working from a position where I have to defend that, you know what, what I did was good, you know, that API is perfect as it is, things like that, as opposed to uh, being uh, f more focused on learning, on what can I do better, and I mean, Rafael's going to talk much more about learning, so I'm going to let him do that. So, the exercise once again. Uh, so, I would like us, the same group of people who tried to memorize, to once again memorize the pictures and those of you who were taking notes to take note. Keep in mind, pen and paper is the key here and you'll learn why uh, in a few minutes from now. I promise. Yeah. Okay. So, come on. This is the pictures. Again, Five seconds, not more. A few of, uh, let's try to remember, let's try to make notes. Don't like draw, just take notes of what you think is important. The lights went down. Okay, so let's learn how to learn actually, because we all heard like our, how our brain works. Radu already mentioned that. We all uh, heard today during the keynote how important learning in our careers actually are. But we also heard that we were never taught how to efficiently learn. And that's actually true. So to give you an idea and take a step back from what Radu mentioned is that our brain uh, can be divided into two pieces if we talk about learning. The f part that uh, takes the knowledge right after we learn it and those caches. So, and we need to find a way to actually transfer the data from one part to the other. We do that during the sleep. When we dream, our mind and actually our brain sorts out that information and transfer, transfers it from this short-term memory to the long-term memory. We are actually, when we learn, we don't want to do it like during a high school, right? We don't want to learn pass the exam and forget. No, we want to encode. And that encoding is actually uh, proven to be efficient when we combine that with a certain activities, like a physical activity, or when we combine that with emotions. So when we try to learn something and combine that with something that we, for example, like, that's more efficient for our brain to sort out during the sleep. But before we go into the learning methods, let me tell you about the history of how the schools were born, actually. You know, in Austria, uh, in the 18th century, uh, the government and uh, Wilhelm Ferdinand III uh, noticed that the teenagers were doing, doing stupid things. They had lots of time and they were not doing anything good for the society, let's call it. So they invented schools. They put teenagers there, the young people had lots of materials to learn, and that's how they didn't have time to do stupid things. And uh, this is how schools work 
even right now, in majority of our countries, at least in the Western world, we are given so much material to learn that we actually have a little time on being creative play and so on. And keep in mind that 18th century was the time when bad smell was considered a root cause for tabernaculis or yellow fever, and potato tomatoes were actually considered poisonous Satan's tools. So that's something to know. And now we are sending people to uh, like an orbit and uh, producing CPUs, right? So that's a complete change in what we do right now. And still, we are teaching our kids the same. And we are actually would never, I was at least, never taught how to learn efficiently. And the research says that there are a lot of methods that are helping us to encode that information. There are for those are only a few of them that I've mentioned. Uh, Radu was mentioning those slides. You can find the papers around those methods there. And I'll talk about uh, a few of them today, the ones that are suitable for IT, for us as developers, to help us learn. So let's start. First of all, like we're Gollum. Lord of the Rings and so on, my knowledge is precious, right? Let's not share it. But it's actually not that way. We, when we are sharing knowledge, we can actually learn something not only new, but we can help ourselves and code that information further into our long-term storage and help ourselves be a better developer, uh, like improve our skills. So first of all, probably you've all heard about that, but you don't know that that comes from research stuff. So we all know per programming probably, or most of us do, right? A more skilled uh, person sits with a less skilled person or more knowledgeable person sits with a less knowledgeable person on the same problem, writing the same code, and uh, doing stuff together. So the more knowledgeable person works as like a mentor there, uh, guiding, showing code, uh, discussing the problem, showing what kind of solution we can use, learning and teaching basically this less skilled person a good uh, way of writing the code. While the less knowledgeable person gains skill quickly, but in addition to that, also gives uh, a view over the problem from a different perspective. Maybe he like, will not be biased towards certain solution that the senior developer, for example, uh, likes to use because he knows that better. And that helps both parties uh, of the equation, right? So, and what's more, because of how the more experienced person uh, will be giving the knowledge, we can get to a tutor method, which, me, which is proven to work. Imagine yourself that you are learning actually new stuff, like you've read a book about uh, programming language. Let's call, I would like to write software for this device, so I'm learning Swift right now. And uh, when I read a chapter, I'm, what I want to do is actually tell someone about it. I can imagine myself uh, talking to my colleagues or I can talk to my colleagues actually and try to describe what I just learned to them. How that will help me? First of all, I'll try to repeat the same knowledge over and over again which will give me some amount of information for our brain to actually encode later on during the sleep. And second of all, I'll start asking questions. I see, okay, I was uh, actually uh, like looking at the stuff and I don't know that part. Okay, I need to ask and I need to research, need to learn more about that because I'm not sure how that works. That helps us again. So we have two of them. Next, don't learn everything at the single step, right? Imagine yourself taking a book about administering Unix systems. Writing, reading it from top to bottom, uh, six, seven hundred of pages, and now I'm skilled. I'm going to do all this stuff with my uh, servers. Yeah, for sure. I guess majority of us will not do that. And I'm not only guessing because research shows that like 70 to 80 percent of us will forget at least 50 percent of the stuff that they just read in that book. So there are methods that help us encode that information. Uh, more, so remember more at the later stage. First of all, the dancer method. It initially comes out with the idea that we need to perform physical exercises and physical like moves 
to encode certain uh, information, just like dancers do. Like you learn a step, and then you practice this over and over again. And the same goes with IT. If you will deploy your first pod in a Kubernetes environment, that may be hard. But if you do it 100 for 100 times, and then you go once again, it will be easy, right? Because you know that. That actually is something that comes from research and is about repetition of the same uh, things that help encode that information into the brain. Next thing is a boxing method. So again, something that uh, tells us that we shouldn't take everything at one step, but just take it slowly. Like read a chapter and sleep on it. Don't take the book as a whole during one uh, read. Just read a chapter or two and sleep on it. That will help you memorize the stuff. Of course, you can combine multiple methods at the same time, which I'll mention, but just don't take the whole knowledge at one uh, sit. And finally, the Parrot method, especially useful for those of us who are doing public speaking and so on. Imagine that you have your slides ready and you would like to practice what you do. You try to imagine yourself at the stage in front of the audience and try to repeat and repeat and repeat the same uh, thing over and over again. This is, for example, what uh, Jobs did before giving keynotes on WWDC uh, at Apple. He did that repetitions for hundreds of times before going into the stage and actually de delivering close to flawless talks. That's how uh, people do it, the ones that are experienced with the public speaking. It, con it allows you to connect your emotions to what you do. Of course, you learn the talk, but also allows you to connect the, the emotions and lowers the stress level the once you get on the stage. The next thing I would like to mention is uh, something for us as developers. We like to uh, have a little amount of stress. Like We don't like the ugly stuff to be do, but somehow someone has to do it. And actually, that puts us in a place where we don't want to get out of our comfort zone. Uh, that really doesn't encourage us to uh, learn. So uh, right now, the studies show, and uh, more and more, for example, project managers are doing that with the teams, and companies are doing that with the teams, large ones, that the method of place switch actually plays a major role. So the idea here is that a person should be switched from put in a, put in a different team, or a team should be switched to a different part of the project uh, in order to kick them out, basically, out of the comfort zone, encourage learning, and force them to gain new skills. Of course, initially, such team or half of the team will be slower, will, have, will be more stressful, because they will not know certain parts of, uh, of things and so on. But then, eventually, they will gain skill and, be, and will become better, which is good for them, for the company. There will be no single point of failure when it comes to developers knowing all, a single developer knowing only about certain part of the system, and so on. And this is, um, I see that more and more uh, used uh, in various companies writing or how their uh, internal um, development teams work, and so on. But again, that's not everything. Also, don't try remembering everything. And we'll get here to that piece of paper and uh, pen and paper uh, method, actually. So the idea here is that if you will read a book, for example, uh, you don't need to remember everything from it. Take a note, take a pen and paper, and the idea here is that it needs to be pen and paper. It doesn't work with any kind of electronic device. It doesn't work with the keyboard. The thing is that our brains react to how we write and how we actually uh, physically write that down on that uh, piece of paper with a pen. I don't know why, but the research shows it works. So basically, when you read something or learn new things, you take a piece of paper and a pen and you write down key information. Of course, you don't have to write another book when you are reading the book, so know every word, but just the key information. That allows us to get back to the knowledge when we need it, and what's more, it helps us memorize that in the longer term. 
so when you want to get back, you'll see, for example, those of you who were noting down, uh, you may not remember that today, but when you get to that pictures in two weeks from now or three weeks from now, you'll see that that makes a lot of difference if you, if you wrote down the key parts that you think were, uh, were the key to those pictures that we'll get back. And finally, who did like tests during primary or high school? Come on, raise your hands. Yes, Adnan, of course you did. Uh, uh, so, but tests are really not bad. Of course, we don't like to be judged as human beings, right? Because we don't like the negative feedback, we all, we'll all like to feel good and so on. However, the tests, not in form of a judgment, but in form of testing ourselves and giving ourselves challenges, are actually very good. Let me tell you a story. There is a crash test method that was researched over and over again. And there was a group of students that were given a book, 30 to 40 pages from what I remember. And uh, then the group was divided into two, like 50% uh, of them were asked to just leave and live their life uh, later. And the other part of the group was uh, given a test, a short test to just uh, without any kind of grades and so on. And then a few weeks later, the same group of people, like the whole group, was asked to do another test based on the knowledge that they got from the book that they read. And you, what eventually turned out is that the group that were doing the test right after reading the book uh, was remembering 50 to 70% information more from that given book. But it all turns like it's all about long-term storage, right? Remember that long-term storage memory. It's all about encoding information. So the tests actually help us how to do that with our normal learning when we learn new programming language and so on. Please notice that when you read a book about the programming, there are always exercises there. They are there on purpose. They help you and code that information. Those are those tests. If they are not there, try come up with something. Try come up with an idea of, okay, I am learned about loops, or I learned how to create win windows on uh, Android or on iOS devices, right? So let's, let's now try to make that. If you will repeat that and test yourself, there's actually two methods combined, but uh, that's just the detail, that will help you encode that information better and generally become a better uh, and more skilled developer, right? So that kind of, I really encourage you to go through that research that, I, that we have uh, uh, in that GitHub because that shows how much effort was there done to actually find the proper learning methods for us. But before we end the talk, let's test ourselves, right? So now, uh, Try to remember those of you who were writing and those of you who were trying to memorize. Do you remember how many pictures were there on this, on this slide? You don't have to answer, just answer to yourselves. So do you remember what kind, what uh, color the parrot was? That's an easy one, right? So tell me how many birds were there. And uh, uh, then, you know, try to answer the same questions Try to give yourself an answer in four weeks from now. You can tweet me, uh, for example, with the answers or reach me out. Uh, and you'll see that those of you who were taking notes uh, were actually got the knowledge uh, a bit longer uh, from time uh, in that. So just use those methods and they really help. Uh, once, for example, I switched from the normal usual learning that we were shown in school, just repeat, repeat, test, repeat. Uh, to, uh, to those methods, I'm able to learn easily and more quicker and remember more, which gives me a new skill set, which is actually what we are all about when it comes to learning. So basically, before we end, like we're a so we provide uh, 
some consultancy for solar elastic search and a product for monitoring infrastructure and so on. But uh, if you would like to reach us out, those are info, our contact information. I encourage you to actually come to our colleague Adnan's talk tomorrow about load balancing Node.js uh, applications. It will be close to the end of the conference, so you know, for chill out. He'll be glad to talk to you, and he's an awesome speaker. Uh, we encourage you to join, like, to go to join in and uh, comment on the talk to tell us what we can improve to become better speakers. And actually, thank you for being here with us. Hopefully, you learned something. And if you have any questions, we're open to that.